we knew that we had made something extremely uh, divisive, right? It's it's so mm -hmm. interesting and different, um, very particular. Like in in allowing ourselves to be ambitious, we also allowed ourselves to make something that was really specific and for us like we love this particular type of weird um but it's not going to be for everyone so we kind of went into it expecting that it would be like that right that it would be like oh this person doesn't like it that's fair this person does like it that's cool like we, we expected it to be more split and so the general kind of reaction which has been overwhelmingly positive we we're like oh i guess we suck at making divisive things Hey everybody, how you doing? Corey here. Uh, I'm here for what is considered to be early for me. You don't have a weird schedule. I'm kind of up in the middle of the day. And if I'm up in the middle of the day recording and I'm not recording at night, that means that I got up for somebody very special. And I am looking forward to talking to the guests that we have here today for another Double Toasted interview. I am privileged to be joined by the game designer who is considered by many to have developed one of the best games of 2022, that is Immortality. Uh, the creator is Sam Barlow. Sam Barlow has not only it. created something here where it is a it is an, an, a, a game, but it's more of an interactive movie also. Sam, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. I'm slowly coming around from having spent three years making a video game to just relaxing back into things and enjoying your success with this i mean it must be great to hear all the uh the the raven reviews on this yeah it's it's i mean releasing a video game is a weird thing uh especially now because it's so kind of virtual right uh, it used to be you'd go to a show and, and maybe you'd even have you know some kind of launch party or something but kind of coming out of the pandemic everything's online so you just you just literally sit in your office and click a button and then it's like it's it's live and so you get and yeah, with this game, we've had some some ridiculously uh, kind of good reviews and, and people really getting into it. And so you have that, which is extremely cool, right? To, to put the thing out there and you're hearing people, you know, digging what you were trying to kind of do with it. But then you'll get you'll get like one email from someone that has a bug or something you know, <laughs> on their particular computer setup. And suddenly everything comes crashing down and you're just like, oh my God, this one person has this issue and and that feels like more traumatic than this kind of abstract you know praise um so it's 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 weird because yeah you and then you're you know going online and seeing people talk about it and, and mm -hmm. you know it's yeah it's it's a whole weird thing do you mind if we show people the trailer for the game sure and before we get into the trailer so i've already kind of described the game as an interactive movie we're going to get more into that but do you want to tell people what the game is about and how the game is played and whatever you want to say about it? Yeah, so the premise of the game, um, there's this actress, Marissa Marcel, who in 1968 uh, is kind of picked uh, as a fresh face to star in this movie. And she goes on to film only three movies. And for various reasons, none of those movies is ever released. And then Marissa Marcel disappears. So now in 2022, there's something of a, you know, there's a kind of urban myth thing. It's this uh, kind of holy grail of lost movies, uh, these three movies that Marissa made. And in the game, you basically get, uh, you uh, we've discovered this cache of footage from these lost movies, all these bits and pieces of film from these missing movies. And you'll kind of go through them like some kind of archival detective watching all these pieces of film to try and discover like what happened to Marissa and put these movies together. And kind of at the core of it is this very cool mechanic where as you're watching a piece of these movies, you can at any time kind of stop and rewind the footage as if you're in one of these old kind of movieola editing machines. And at any point you can stop the footage and then just click on something on screen, whether that's an actor's face or a prop or a piece of imagery. And the game will immediately cut to another scene, another piece of footage in which that appears. So you're kind of creating your own cut of these movies, kind of creating this montage that allows you to kind of follow trails deeper and deeper into the mystery. That's interesting. We're going to look at the game right now, but the way you're describing it is almost like in addition to trying to solve a mystery, you're also editing your own film in a way. Yeah, I mean, we really wanted 
you know, if the if the idea of this game was, what does it feel like to be the person that is discovering these lost movies and is kind of, you know, reaching into the past, trying to figure out what mm-hmm. happened in this woman's life. And so we wanted to make it feel like you were sat at one of these machines, right? Really sell that kind of mechanical nature. And, you know, this is a... Uh, it's it's kind of a setup that we're familiar with, right? There's so many horror movies where at some point someone goes into the old library and they get out like the microfiche machine, right? And they're kind of yeah, going yeah. through it, trying to looking through, find, oh my God, what's that? Like that was the kind of experience we wanted where you have this kind of mechanical feel, the sense that there's just all this footage and you're discovering things and, and kind of falling down the rabbit hole. So yeah, it, it's, yeah, you're kind of one part editor, kind of getting close and intimate with this footage and one part sort of detective. And at the same time, you're like a, a movie, part of the movie audience, because you're getting to watch these movies that no one's seen before, that uh, you know been lost to time and you're putting the pieces together. Nice. We're gonna go ahead and take a look at the, at the trailer because also, you know, there's a lot of things that are just really visually cool with this movie that we'll talk about, or this game. You see, I call it a movie because it's so well done. <laughs> uh, this, this game that we'll talk about in a little bit, but to give people an idea of what it's like, let's go ahead and take a look at the trailer right now. All right, well, we've got to take a short break here. Do you mind reading this out yeah. uh, for us? Now, Marvelous Magic will turn the next 60 seconds into a commercial. Our star, our gorgeous, la bellissima Marisa Marcel. What is your name? Marissa Marcel. Did we get it right? Give us a turn. It's not what you think it is. Are you funny? Is she okay? You know, this is uh, your third interactive game. And by the way, I believe that you can get the game right now on on, uh, on Steam and Xbox Game Pass, right? Yes. Yeah, you can get it on Xbox, Windows PC, get it on Steam. We will very soon be coming to Netflix games. So anyone that has an iPhone or an Android device will be able to play it for free if they have a Netflix account. So we're trying to get it out there, get as many people to play it as possible. Oh, that's, that's uh, actually very cool that you're taking uh, advantage of the platforms, not only gaming platforms, but s- since it's an interactive movie, you're taking advantage of movie platforms too, like Netflix. That's, uh, that's, a, that's a great approach, I think. Um, yeah, the Netflix thing's very interesting, right? Because, yeah, we, there's been this constant thing of like games, movies, TV, slowly converging. Obviously, the games we're making have this interesting hybrid nature but, you know, there is, I mean, at this point, I think your average person on the street is as likely to play games, right, as they are to watch TV. So kind of seeing all these things come together uh, feels good. So this is your, is this your third interactive game? Uh, this is the third uh, of my independent games of this kind of style. So I've worked for about 15 years, 10, 15 years uh, in more traditional games. Uh, I directed uh, a couple of Silent Hill games, uh, some other games that people will never have played, right? yeah. <laughs> starting out, movie tie-ins, that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, in 2015 was when I brought out a game called Her Story. So that was kind of like an interesting point in the industry. We'd had mobile games blow up. Everyone was realizing like, oh, if we make a free-to-play game about bursting bubbles, we could make... Uh, you know, millions of dollars. And <laughs> the effort back then to make, you know, quote unquote, like a proper video game, it was getting more and more expensive, right? So I was making these games that were kind of character driven story games. And, you know, those things were expensive, right? And it was getting to the point where, unless you were like Sony doing an Uncharted or, uh, you know, it was Ubisoft doing one of their huge games, like there just weren't that many games mm-hmm. being made. So I kind of, made the the educated decision to be like well if if i can't do this as a triple a game with the big publishers then i'm going to go independent so 
uh, yeah, the first game I made was this game called Her Story, which at the time was was very novel because it was a, a kind of police procedural murder mystery, and it was it was all done through a police computer going through the police database looking at footage of this woman being interviewed by the police. So that was you know the first, and then since then I made a game called Telling Lies, and now Immortality, and all three of the games in a very different way have been sort of playing with the idea of exploring story and exploring video um you know it's it's a very loose loose analogy but if you think of the way like uh, and if you play a mario game or a mario game uh you know you're running around exploring these worlds jumping around um and and so many video games rely on that sensation of just how fun it is to run around in a 3d space jumping or shooting or hitting things with swords and, and really what I've been doing is kind of asking the question, what if you could explore the story? What if you could explore a film with that level of freedom, right? So instead of running and jumping, you're scrubbing and cutting through a movie. But it's about giving people that much control and freedom over watching something as you would have, you know, playing a more conventional game. So I guess the, the appeal of doing an interactive video game that's more like an interactive movie, I guess would be one, accessibility, you know, just not having to go through a crazy budget and crazy production, you know, like you would a blockbuster film. And also, I, I guess you would say that there's a certain amount of, uh, another level of freedom or another style of freedom for these games than the traditional video game. Yeah, I mean, the, the cool thing is people that wouldn't normally play video games, right, or identify as, as being video gamers, these are games that uh you know someone will ask their partner to sit on the sofa and play with right or they'll like stick it on their parents phone and be like you should check this thing out it's kind of cool um so you you know they they definitely have this cool life where they're able to pull people in for whom like a more conventional video game would not work um and then on the other you know side of things like whenever i speak to people in tv and movies they're all terrified because they're seeing that you know uh the previous generation everyone would sit on the sofa as a family and watch network TV and you'd sell adverts and everyone made a lot of money or you'd have a big movie and everyone would go to the movies on Friday night and watch the big movie, right? Mm -hmm. And now you have a generation where the kids are like, oh, I might like binge a couple of hours of Netflix, but then I'm going to go watch three hours of YouTube. I'm going to talk to my friends on the phone all the time. I'm going to be on social media whilst I'm doing that. I'm going to go play three hours of Fortnite and so the TV movie people are terrified because they're like, oh, my God, no one is doing like watching traditional TV. So they're all kind of racking their brains like, well, how do we make television more interactive? How do we take, you know, make television as addictive as these video games the kids are playing? And I think there is an aspect to what I'm doing, which is taking those traditional stories and saying, well, what does it feel like if we do make it more interactive, if we do make it more expressive, if we give... You know, if, if person A sits down to play this game and someone else plays it, they're going to have a different experience and they're going to you know, then talk to each other and have this fun kind of dialogue of being like, did you see this? Why did this happen? And everyone has their own little theories. So it's it's really kind of plugging into how people, you know, do things right now and applying that to a more traditional narrative. You know, that's uh, hearing the way you, you describe this, uh, how all this stuff is merging makes me think about and want to go back to uh, this going to Netflix. So was, uh, was, was this something that you're in pitch to Netflix or did Netflix approach you about this? And did you try any other streaming services before you uh, approached Netflix? Yeah, I mean, the Netflix thing came about because, um, yeah, they're setting up this, this game service there, right, which I think is interesting because it's, uh, you know, we've seen little experiments, right? We've seen uh, HBO did a thing with Soderbergh called Mosaic. Uh, obviously, Netflix uh, did things like Bandersnatch. So we've seen these kind of big streaming companies kind of you know, dip their toe in the water of gaming and interactivity. But to see Netflix be like, no, we're just going to straight up give you games, right? Like, we're, we're not trying to create a hybrid. We're just going to straight up say, we know you're going to be playing games for two hours. So let's make that part. Of, of, of our offering and um, for me as a, as a game designer it's exciting to see that kind of cultural equivalency right mm -hmm. a lot of times 
you know, if, if you open up a newspaper and they got like their art section, it's like a big thing about a television show and a movie, the game section will be, you know, some little little thing on a back page or something. And, and, and people, you know, don't see them as being equivalent as terms, you know, as how you might spend your entertainment time. So having something like Netflix be like, oh, you're going to have your movies, you have your TV, and you have your games, it's all on the front page of Netflix. Like, this is all just equally valid stuff that you can do to enjoy yourselves. Like, for us, that was super exciting. And obviously, with the, the kind of start of this game, uh, mm. you know, we just, you know, when we had that first conversation with them, there just seems to be a huge synergy because, uh, you know, the types of content, the kind of uh, the maturity of their content, the kind of tone and genres that they have, you know, and there's a drama and horror and thrillers and things that, you know, that felt like home to us more so than you know some of the kind of traditional game stuff so you know for us it was just another way to reach that bigger audience and you know meet people who might otherwise not think about this right um which was certainly you know my experience with, with her story and telling lies was sometimes people would give those games to a family member they'd go away play them for you know x hours and they'd come mm -hmm. back and be like that was that was really cool and the, the person would be like, oh, how did you enjoy playing the, a video game? And they'd be like, oh, I didn't even realize I was playing a video game. <laughs> this was just like this cool thing that was on my phone. I guess, yeah, I guess that's a game. Uh, and, and it's funny that, you know, I'm, that's why I mentioned, uh, that's why I mentioned Netflix because they, they they were getting, it seemed like kind of really invested in not just, you know, the, 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 the game side of things. We know that Netflix is trying to make a, you know, a, the video game version of their service, but you're right with Black Mirror, and recently they just did an animated uh, interactive game. But uh, Black Mirror did the Bandersnatch episode, and that's why I thought like maybe they approached you because it seemed like exactly what they were trying to, you know, what they're trying to do today, you know, get ease people into gaming by just kind of crossing these two mediums of video games and movies. But you know, when when I think about, uh, or when a lot of people think about interactive games especially people my age you know they might be in you might be thinking about this too but they, they think about games like this you control the actions of a daring adventurer finding his way through the castle of a dark wizard who has infected with treacherous monsters and obstacles of course that's that, that is uh that is dragon's lair and uh the other thing it might be thinking of is uh, uh people my age might remember is uh is night trap uh I don't know if you remember that game, but were any of those two games ever uh were they were they influences on what you did or what you do? No, it's just, it's super interesting because yeah, once um so I was aware of of that stuff um especially, you know, uh yeah, Night Trap was it's like this fascinating piece of history. Uh, where it started out as like Mattel trying to make a game using a video player, right? And it, it ran on a video cassette. And then at some point when the CD-ROMs came along, they kind of jumped onto that. But famously, Night Trap is the reason that games have age ratings because uh, it, it kind of escalated to like the, the Supreme Court and the Senate or whatever, where they, was, they pulled up Night Trap and said, look at this horrific game <laughs> where, where <laughs> yeah. young women are being killed by vampires. Uh, children are murdering women running around in their underwear or whatever, uh, not realizing that like the idea of the game was to save them, right? It was like you were the hero of this horror movie. But uh, and then famously, uh, Nintendo took the stand and Nintendo said, never till the end of time will this filth be on a Nintendo console. Night Trap will never be on a Nintendo console. And like two years ago, they remastered it. So you can now buy it on a Switch. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can, you can, you can go and, uh, you know, rewrite, rewrite that history. But um, I mean, the interesting thing was, so when I made her story, I had been working, um, like I say, in kind of traditional games. So, you know, with my Silent Hill games, uh, before I went and made her story, I was working for three years on this big AAA game that then got cancelled. Um, but I was working with a lot of kind of motion capture, you know, CGI, all those kind of traditional kind of character game mechanics. And when I set out to go make her story, all I really knew was that I wanted to make a, a some kind of police procedural mystery game, right? And I'd kind of grown up loving uh, shows like Homicide Life on the Street, um, 
I named my son after Andre Brown because I was like obsessed with seeing him in the interrogation room. And so I was, I was trying to figure out like, how do I make a video game that, that captures that moment in, in those kind of interviews um, and did a lot of research into it. And it was around the time, this was like 2014, 2013, where like true crime was just about to blow up. Right. It was, uh, I think when the game came out, Serial came out at the same time. So I had discovered all this footage of real life interviews and interrogations and kind of watching that for research kind of slowly it's like at some point I just kind of woke up and I was like, wait a minute, why, you know, I don't have to create CGI characters. I don't have to have, you know, cartoon characters or whatever the options were. I could just film this stuff and would have this texture and already I'd be capturing a performance from the actor that would be better than what we would get if we were having to put it through the CGI stuff. So kind of with her story, I kind of fell into using this technique um, and, and the conceit there of the fact that you were searching through these police databases, you know, that kind of came out very organically. And I think it was literally uh, just before I released her story, I took it to one of these game shows, put it on display, and a journalist came up to me and said, what on earth made you want to resurrect the FMV game, one of these interactive movies, right? Like that mm -hmm. died in the 90s. Uh, you know, and they're thinking Dragon's Lair, Night Trap, et cetera. And that was the first time I was like, oh, crap, yeah, I have unwittingly gone, you know, tapped into this, this extinct genre. And so then I had to go away and sort of educate myself about it. And, and kind of since then, I've been more kind of conscious of it and just thinking about like what's exciting about bringing game mechanics, about bringing the interactivity to the act of watching something, right? How do I make a, a viewer of a story be more involved in it in a way that's very different? Like I think the reason people think badly of those old games is, is oftentimes they were trying to replicate a more traditional game experience, right? So in the case of Dragon's Lair, they're trying to give you an exciting, fast-paced sword fight. But whereas, you know, in a normal game, it can be very responsive, right? The jumping, the moving, it's all simulated. In the case of Dragon's Lair, it was, you know, you, you press the button at the right time and you win, you press it at the wrong time, you die. So you end up with something that looks beautiful, right? Like Dragon's Lair <laughs> looks fantastic. But the, the gameplay is very frustrating and simple because there's no way that a, a piece of live-action footage can replicate all the different options within a normal game. So I think, I mean, Night Trap actually is a good example in that clearly when they were making Night Trap, they were thinking like, well, if this is based on pre-filmed footage, the idea that you're watching and spying on people makes sense, right? Like mm -hmm. that is inherently something that works well in that format. Kind of what didn't work in Night Trap is they were like, oh, it's a game, so you need a score and you need a game over. And so they, you know, made put these little mini challenges in it. So you'd watch it, get 20 minutes into it, die, get a game over and and restart it. And then you're just watching the same thing again. So they, they very quickly became kind of frustrating and repetitive. So, you know, what I've done is quite different because we're not pretending that you're a character in this story, right? We're not pretending that you're walking around in the dungeon, that you're going to go left or right or swing a sword or not. It's It's 100% looking at the idea of watching and searching through video, putting the pieces together. It's like a big elaborate kind of jigsaw puzzle. Um, so it's, it's kind of a very different thing and it plugs into how obsessive we are these days. Right. Uh, we always, we, we kind of talk about rabbit holing, you know, when you're like, mm -hmm. once someone says something or you see someone on TV and you Google it and then suddenly two hours later, you just followed this web of links into some obscure piece of trivia on the internet, right? That's kind of what these games do. We're, we're trying to kind of weaponize that and, and use that energy that we have, that obsessiveness in a way that is going to, you know, give you something emotional and kind of resonant. You know, uh, speaking of giving you something em emotional, I mean, a lot of that re re would rely on the, the narrative part of things, you know, the movie making part of things. And that's what I'm really fascinated by here because, you know, I mean, we're making interactive movies, you're making movies. And in this case, uh, 
you made three different kind of films here. <laughs> uh, the, first of all, are you directing the movies that we see here? Yes. Yeah, it's, 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 there's so much complexity going on that I think that's partly how we get away with it is, you know, and, and sometimes you'll see with these kind of Hollywood gaming collaborations, they'll be like, well, this is the point where the, the gaming people stand back and we'll bring the movie people in, right? And, and oftentimes when that's about story or mechanics, everything gets kind of squishy. Mm. Um, so for us kind of be, you know, having the oversight of the whole thing, um, is, is really how we kind of keep all this richness together. Uh, you know, I'm, uh, this, I'm admiring what you're doing because in addition to designing a game, as I said, you're making a movie. So, you know, is it twice as much work? Because when you make this, you know, you have to design the game, but then you have to do the movie making aspects. You know, you have the cinematography that needs to be done. You have the directing of the movie itself. You have the staging of the actors and the direction of the actors. Uh, so is it twice as much work or is it just a different kind of, uh, of work that is that amounts to as much work as a video game? I think it's probably three or four times as much work. It's <laughs> like the trick. If we have a trick, right? Sometimes people play my games. They'll be like, I can't imagine how this works. They're like, how did you make this work? They're like, it's magic. How did you make it that the story still makes sense even if I do all these different things? Like, uh, you know, in this game, we have this mechanic where you can yeah, click on anything and it'll jump to something else like how does that even work and and the trick is we just do loads of work like, it's like, yeah. i think it's like the magician's trick the, the magician right is you show someone a simple trick and and the the secret is that you did thousands of hours of work to prepare mm -hmm. for this trick right more more work than anyone would ever imagine therefore it, it feels like magic so with these we definitely set out and with this game in particular from the start we like we just want to make something that is stupidly ambitious, right? Like, like, it's want to swing for the fences. And so, yeah, it's going to encompass three movies, three different decades, pulls in this whole history of like the second half of the 20th century of movie making. And, and, and yes, yeah, it's, it's not just you have the game and, and kind of the game mechanics and how that works. And then you have the movie. But what is really interesting about this game is you're not just seeing the movies, but you're seeing what's going on behind the scenes of the movies, right? So you'll watch a, a scene, and if you rewind, you'll see the clapperboard come in and go away, and you'll see the cast and crew run in. Um, so you're picking up on, like, well, what happened five minutes ago? What happened just before they yelled action, right? And then when they cut, you see the interactions between the different actors and things. You, that's where you start to pick up on, like, this bigger story, Mm -hmm. and is lurking behind the scenes so there's that whole story right so we're telling we're telling these three unique movies from different decades filmed with different technology different filming styles different you know costume styles we, we start with ambrosio which is like a historical costume drama filmed on the studio set with uh you know painted backdrops very kind of uh you know old school movie making yeah. with some kind of interesting in-camera tricks and then you go to New York in the 70s for this film Minsky, which is now kind of part of the new Hollywood. Everything is handheld and very different and organic. Everything is being filmed on location. And then for the final movie, you jump forward to 1999, which is being shot in LA. And there's this story of a pop star and, you know, it has a very different texture to it. When they're rehearsing, they're rehearsing on mini DV. So like we're tapping into all these different aspect ratios, film grain, different movie methods you know just all of this kind of interesting stuff yeah that's all happening and then you have this story and then there are some other layers that we don't talk about because this is kind of a this is a kind of a, a, a spooky supernatural story as well so there are other elements that creep in um so like i say yeah it's it's it is doing way more work than you would normally do to release an independent video game but i think for me like that's that's a way of just ensuring that at the end of the day, the player is, you know, I think it's a, it's a weird game, right? It's, it's not a traditional video game. So I think when people sit down to play it and make the effort to pick out something that's different, they're making a certain amount of effort. And then when you get into the game, the player has so much freedom and we respect their intelligence so much that again, you're kind of asking even more of them 
they're not just sitting back and letting a thing wash over them they're having to kind of think so for that to work i think on the other hand you as the game maker have to be generous right you have to be saying to people look at all this cool stuff we've made and we're giving it to you like we've really gone out of our way to make this a you know fantastic package because i think then if, if people see that gives them a certain confidence that like this is going to be a, a good experience and it's worth that extra effort so i guess needless to say shooting between you know three different time periods was that how, how difficult was that because you know now you're getting into areas like i said you're getting into you know not just cinematography but you're getting into different styles of cinematography at this point which i imagine you know stylistically that creates creates a lot of work for you how difficult was that um i mean a lot of it it was i mean it was it was difficult but it was the kind of difficult that's fun right so you know when you, you you pull together a crew and so you know we're pulling in lots of people that you know would normally work on kind of indie movies and things and we're not necessarily paying the most so why is why are these people going to come work for us and, and you know put their craft to work making this thing and when you sit them down you're like we're going to do this this and this and these are all these things we're doing it's going to be very hard and we're doing all these challenging things there's a certain type of person that's like well that sounds good that sounds cool like i want to come in and push myself flex these muscles and particularly here where we're going back in time to these certain filming techniques for a lot of people they were like i don't get to work like that anymore right i don't get to work with painted backdrops and, and building sets because now we just do it in a big green screen mm -hmm. and and it's all fake so there were people that just really relished the you know the chance to get stuck in to this stuff um we we'd have like funny things where there would be members of the crew that was that were young enough that they'd never worked on film before, right? They'd, they'd only worked digitally. And so you'd talk about things, like we have matte paintings in this, traditional matte paintings, um, which is where you, you paint on a piece of glass and put it in front of the camera. And then when the actor is filmed, it looks as if they're stood in front of, you know, a giant vista or whatever. And, and that was what they did instead of CGI. And you'd be talking through this scene explaining that there's going to be a map painting here and these crew members in their heads a map painting is when you have green screen and someone's digitally painting <laughs> yeah. something in and you're rotoscoping people out and so they're like where's the green screen for the map we're doing the map painting where's the green screen and then you're explaining like oh if someone stands here they're behind the painting like they're just going to disappear uh and and, and they're just like they're like how what how is this working like it's 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 really interesting to to make people think about which is partly what is fun about the game is taking people kind of back in time and giving them just a moment to just appreciate maybe even you know more so than if you're watching an old movie right to to actually pay attention to and obsess over the the ways in which these things were filmed um but yeah a lot, i mean people just had in so many ways fun right lots of different fun in doing this like you know the, the the director of photography is like oh well this movie uh they wouldn't have had handheld cameras right and they everything would have been on a dolly track and this is how big the cameras were and then we go out and we get all the original lenses so we're working with lenses from the time period working with the original lights that would have been used at that time setting everything up and enjoying you know kind of um the, how, it's a little bit more hands-on right these old things and then mm -hmm. when we're in the 70s like i'm obsessed with uh, the director nick rogue who uh, is kind of infamous for these crazy zooms he'll have for no excuse at all in a scene he'll just be looking at a character and then this they'll turn around and zoom in he'll go through a window and zoom into like a, a bird on the, the, the branch of a tree he's doing it all the time and people don't do that as more as much these days but he at that time zoom motors had just been invented right for cameras so this was this novelty of being able to zoom in and out everywhere so I would like every other scene, I'd be saying to the DP, like, can we do a Nick Rogue zoom? And he'd be like, no more. Like, you've got enough. He's chilling with the Nick Rogue zooms. And, and like split diopters, I was obsessed with. Uh, like the split diopter is a technique where the lens that goes in front of the camera is actually two lenses. And, and one of them magnifies more than the other. So you'll see this in like a lot of old movies use it um, to help them focus on different parts of the scene in the same shot uh, mm -hmm. like brian de palma famously was obsessed with it um, and has it in all his movies um, but yeah most people on the set had not used those a lot or, or seen them before and so then you're setting them up and you're, you're 
doing these these crazy shots where you have someone like in the foreground who's super super in focus and then a character in the far background steps in they're in focus too like super interesting but you know something that you wouldn't necessarily like if you put that in a movie today it would probably stand out right and, and feel kind of out of place so you know just getting to play with with all that that kind of toolkit was was fun i think for everyone i think the, the only person that would complain was um the uh the sfx people when we're in like the 60s and we had blood we'd be like this has to be like that bright red 60s blood right <laughs> it has to be the fake looking <laughs> bright red blood and they'd be like i can't do that they're like i can't it looks so fake and we're like you have to like no one's gonna judge you and say that you're bad because this is what it used to look like right like it just would look look silly or whatever so uh you know we had, to put, we had to push some people to kind of fully engage so it sounds like you did a lot of old school school filmmaking and filmmaking techniques uh did you did you shoot on film for a lot of this no, that was like, that was one of the interesting challenges. We looked at, um, there's been some really good examples recently of, of um, I remember like uh, Rian Johnson with uh, Knives Out, and they talked about that quite a lot, where he had, he was insistent that they shoot on film for that movie. And, and his DP was like, you don't need to anymore, dude. Uh, he was like, the lenses is what, is, he's like, the lenses is like 90% of what you imagine is film right he's like shooting on these traditional lenses and stuff gives you a certain look and then in terms of how the the image comes through like here are a bunch of clever things we can do with math which will actually give you that texture and replicate that you know those things that give you the richness associated with film so we did um actually some some fascinating stuff with um looking into like the photochemistry of film grain because uh, one of the things we knew going into this was like if you watch an old movie on streaming and and you don't have a great connection or if, or if the particular streamer is compressing in a certain way all of that beautiful crisp grain right that you associate with the old movies i guess washed out or becomes kind of bleh. Um so we talked a lot about well like, you know this is going to be a digital game so all of the stuff ultimately is going to be encoded digitally and compressed how do we retain any grain that we have in the image um and we thought we were being very clever coming up with this very custom because we're in a game engine like one of the, the, the interesting things here is like you know if you're watching a a bandersnatch or something you know that the technology there is relatively limited because it's mm -hmm. it's playing on your tv and it's basically serving up videos because we're in a game engine, you know, the, the kind of game engine that normally would, you know, render photorealistic space marines jumping around and doing all sorts of stuff. We have like a lot of processing power and kind of visual stuff. So we put a lot of effort into uh, at runtime, re-adding and rebuilding the grain in a way that was kind of photorealistic and would ensure that you actually had like an extremely kind of accurate grain that was not being kind of compressed or degraded. Which was important because you're doing a lot in this game. like when you click on face it'll kind of zoom into their face and use that to make the match cut it kind of and, and that was like a semi-conscious thing to remind people of like this analog wonder that is film like these, these are not people who are like a tv set it's just dots of light right it's it's <laughs> yeah. somebody is, is you know capturing this on a piece of film or on a digital sensor or whatever so we knew that we were going to be zooming in and out and if, if you were zooming in to something that looked like crap looked compressed right if you walk up to your tv when you're streaming something it doesn't always look great so it was really important to us that we find a way to kind of retain that texture and grain and that's been something that people have really kind of responded to you know we've talked about of course the game we've talked about gaming mechanics but talking about film has been such a big part of the conversation here and you know you've been talking about film te techniques the, the language of film uh, you know in a way history of film um, and also you've been influenced by a lot of filmmakers that and, and a lot of writers too but a lot of filmmakers that have uh, had a lot of influence on this game you know Hitchcock uh, David Lynch um, so you know talking about the the writers in the in the in the filmmakers that have influenced you what video games have actually influenced you over time? You know, because you also have a big career in video games. Well, I think, I mean, that's the thing that people are surprised by 
because if they know me only through these games, they're like, oh, Sam's that guy that makes these games that, you know, are evoking movies or, or kind of visual storytelling. And so it's easy to, to point to those guys. Um, but for me, like, I never stop thinking about this as a game. And like my, my obsession, and I'll kind of bore people silly talking about like Nintendo games. Because for me, when it comes to like the craft of video games, when it comes to the game feel of like, what does it actually feel like in your hands to play this game? When it comes to like giving people freedom and expressivity, for me, like Nintendo is, 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 is up there. So there are so many ways in which making a game like this, which, which on the surface looks like a very different type of video game. All of my references are like Zelda, Mario, Metroid, uh, you know, we talk a lot about mm. uh, if you play a Metroid game, you'll kind of land on a planet and you run around exploring all these different parts of the planet and you'll get abilities which then let you r travel backwards and access new areas. And so slowly the the kind of jigsaw puzzle of this planet opens up in a very nonlinear way. And part of the joy of those games as a player is because you're, re you know, backtracking around, moving back and forth through these spaces, figuring out where you can now get access to. Like one of the joys is that you build up a very, very clear mental map in your head of this world. So it starts to feel like a real place more than just a, you know, a backdrop. Um, and, and we kind of try and hit those same notes here where, you know, when you're playing Immortality, you're slowly uncovering these pieces of film and, and part of the game is going back to things you've already seen, watching them again, now with insight from having seen another piece of footage, and suddenly you're unlocking like an understanding, right? And, and as you get these pieces of film, you're essentially creating this larger map in your head of the story and the characters. And every time you discover a new character or discover a new key kind of moment, those are kind of like getting a new key or a new weapon or in these kind of Nintendo games because they unlock an understanding. So we're always kind of talking about like structurally, how does a, how does a Zelda game work? How does a Metroid game work? Um, you know, the most recent Zelda game is I think just fantastic in the way that it gives people freedom, right? So the, the Breath of the Wild drops you in this giant fantasy kingdom and basically says you can go anywhere you want. And what to me was really inspiring there was there's a lot of these open world games now where it's like oh you can explore the whole of this city this town this whole planet or whatever and so many of them the space that you're given is kind of redundant because it's really just about going from here to the next quest marker or oh there's a hundred things i have to do so i'm going to go from here and it will take me 10 minutes to drive from here to here and, and it's just a way of like spreading out the, the kind of the, the time wasting whereas in Zelda, what, what kind of is amazing to me is they made this game where they said, if you're going to be walking around and exploring this huge open world, the walking is going to be fun. The exploring is going to be fun. We're going to make it so that walking through this field, seeing the grass blow in the wind is inherently in itself fun. That seeing a distant little bit of smoke or a strange tree over here, and I'm going to wander over this mountain, see what it is, like that is inherently kind of enjoyable and that's really the hallmark of a nintendo game is that that kind of minute to minute what you're doing is you know has a richness to it and, and so for us we're like well we've created this all this content these three movies and these stories underlying all the movies for you to explore but kind of to get to that the minute to minute like winding through this film using the the kind of machinery of this kind of movieola to stop and frame advance rewind see and, and feel the analogness of this film right and then seeing the details when you stop and pause or go into slow motion kind of appreciating the details that are in the movies that has to you know that is a game mechanic and that has to be as fun as running and jumping in mario right or as as, as kind of driving around in a car game or something mm -hmm. so we're always looking back to those kind of core you know if you think of a video game like nintendo is you know, is, is the purest kind of uh, version of video gaming. So that there's this, you know, very direct line back to that stuff. So I have a couple of more things that I want to ask you before we're done here. Um, actually, it's about three things I'm very interested in. Uh, and I'll ask these real quickly. Uh, so for this game, you know, we've been talking about the visuals a lot, but 
of course, it's the writing that is the real strength behind this that a lot of people enjoy. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you have a lot of writers working on this who have worked on critically acclaimed TV shows and, and movies. Uh, you know, for people who are listening, I'm looking at like Alan Scott, Don't Look Now, Queen's Gambit, Amelia Gray, Mr. Robot, Maniac, Barry Gifford, Wild at Heart, Lost Highway. Uh, how did you choose these writers to work with, and what, what, what is the reaction when you approach them to working on a video game? This part of it was like a real trip. So, so what we did early on is we were doing a lot of research into the history of movies, into these particular time periods. And a, a part of that was we were going out and meeting people who had worked on famous movies and had worked with or, you know, been key figures on the various movies that we were kind of looking to in these periods. And it was, it was surprising how easy it was to speak to these people. Um, Cause you know, you're like, oh my God, this person worked on this incredible movie. Uh, they're gonna want to talk to us. Then you ring them up and you're like, "Hey, we're making this independent video game. Do you want to chat?" And they're like, "Cool." And they get, you know, people get excited because they they see this as being like something that's new and and of the future, right? So they're like, "Oh, I'm interested in seeing what the the kids. I mean, not me, the younger people that work for me, but like, <laughs> I'm interested in seeing what like is happening that's new and, and interesting." So they're always open to talking. Um, and, and they gave us lots of insights and, and some really interesting anecdotes about working on these classic movies. So then the next step was for us, knowing that we wanted to create these very authentic movies, why don't we bring in people that actually worked on, at the time, on some of these movies that we're talking about, with some of these directors we're talking about? Um, so like part of the initial task was like, going down the list and being like, who is still alive? Who's still working? <laughs> and then like, who will talk to us, right? Um, and, you know, and, and then we would ring them up and have these kind of long conversations with them. And it was the funny thing was we would, we'd, we'd talk to them and they'd be like, oh, this is really interesting. Like, I would love to write on a video game. I have never written on a video game before. I imagine it's completely different and interesting and, and you know, this is going to be exciting. And then you're like, whoa, no. Actually, we want you to write something that is is exactly a movie, right? Like, you're not going to be writing a choose your own adventure. You're not going to be writing like you know all the lines for the enemies that you're chasing across the battlefield. Like, we actually are trying to create these full screenplays for these movies, and we want them to be authentic to the the, the genres and to the time periods, which is why we're we're bringing you. So, in fact, forget that we said video game. Right? Just pretend <laughs> this is a movie assignment. Um, and then we, you know, we, we kind of gave them these, these outlines we had and these loose ideas and kind of let them go play, which I think was fun because, because no matter how big you are, if you're writing a screenplay, usually you're getting notes from the studio, right? And there's just all sorts of crap uh, involved. Uh, and we were encouraging them to just, you know, go have fun with these things, like just go and write something that is, is really cool. Um, so it was kind of a fun, free, uh, you know, little uh, jaunt for them, and um, yeah, it, was, it worked out really well because we we just knew that yeah, if we were going to put all the effort into filming these things authentically, right, in terms of the visuals, we we're going to go to all this effort. Like we wanted to make sure that the the voices, the dialogue, the scripts, the you know the way these movies are structured, that it would be kind of true to the period. So, you put in all this work. And you try to make this as great as you can and as authentic as uh, as you can. Most people love the game. Of course, you know there's, you're going to get some uh, some naysayers out there. You know when the reviews come through, and I want to get your opinion on what you thought about this. So, you know, this is in the minority of reviews here, of course. But uh -huh. I'm, I'm looking at. I mean, you might have seen this already because you're smiling. But uh, <laughs> inverse, inverse. Their review says it in the in the in the headline here. Immortality is an intriguing movie experiment, but a mediocre video game. Um, when you see that, do you do you think that there's a bias going in where people are expecting a more traditional game and maybe they just they just don't get it? Uh, you know, they're not used to seeing something that that is more experimental or different. I don't know. I think, I think it's a. I have seen that review. Um, <laughs> well, you, um, you said you have seen it. And review? I think, I have seen that review. Um, 
And I feel like they have bigger problems than just beyond that. But but obviously that's a very pithy headline. Um, and I feel like it's it is a weird. I mean, it's a weird thing to say. Uh, I think they said it more concisely somewhere else. Like, oh, the, yeah. If if it's if it's intriguing and fun in this context, then the, it it doesn't. You know, like then it's if it's if it's a fun thing. Right? If you're having fun with this thing, it doesn't really matter what label you put on it. Um, but obviously, what we've just been saying, for me, this is as much a video game, and the reasons it work are as inherently tied to its video gameness, right? So for me, it's not easy to separate those two things. Um, and you know, if you don't like the game, which I mean, the 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 crazy thing with this experience has been like going into launching this game, we knew that we had made something extremely. Uh, divisive, right? It's it's so mm -hmm. interesting and different, um, very particular. Like in in allowing ourselves to be ambitious, we also allowed ourselves to make something that was really specific and for us. Like we love this particular type of weird, um, but it's not going to be for everyone. So we kind of went into it expecting that it would be like that right that it would be like oh this person doesn't like it that's fair this person does like it that's cool like we, we expected it to be more split and so the general kind of reaction which has been overwhelmingly positive we we're like oh i guess we suck at making divisive things because <laughs> most people seem to like it um so you know we it, we had you know for me uh i'm perfectly happy for people not to like it right or for it not to be to their tastes um but you know, I, if, if, if you start then making blanket statements about what can and can't be a video game, uh, you know, that's, for me, the bit where uh, I kind of tune out. Um, but it's, I think it's very different now. Like when I started, um, you know, when I started in games, every video game, you know, it had to be a very, every video game has to be a very specific type of video game. Um, uh, which was not the case when I, when I grew up, like I had a, a home computer in the 80s and uh, back in england where everyone had spectrums and, and was you know bedroom coders people were just flinging stuff at the wall like the games that were coming out were just so random and different and punk and interesting we just had that we didn't have an idea then of what a video game should be mm -hmm. and there were these all sorts there was, i remember this game called deus ex machina which had uh, john pertwee who was like one of the doctor who's uh, you played the game and you stuck a cassette in because the sound didn't, wasn't very good back then. You stuck a cassette into your cassette player and, and pressed play at the same time you started playing the game. John Pertwee is then narrating like a spoken word poem whilst you as the player controlled uh, what began as a sperm and then turned into a baby <laughs> and you lived the entire life cycle of a human being, including growing old and dying, like in this 8-bit spectrum game, right? So there was all this interesting stuff when I was growing up. And then kind of when video games started to become a little bit more of serious business, right? Things and become, became more expensive and more complicated. Things really started to kind of narrow um, in terms of, well, it's either a platform game or it's a fighting game or it's a racing game or it's a role playing game, right? It was, and, and those games had very specific ways that they should work. Um, and, and so even when like Her Story came out in 2015, you know, you, it was still the kind of thing that people would in a large part remark upon like oh what is this this is very different is this really a video game but now i feel like now you know we've we've had mobile gaming blow up so there's all sorts of different people playing games on their phones they play differently because you don't have a controller um mm. you know everyone is 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 just engaging with stuff at a whole different level so my parents are using twitter right and, and doing stuff on their phones so everyone's kind of in this world now so i feel like it's a lot easier to, to expand that definition now. Um, so, you know, I think it's, yeah, I think that's that's kind of a discussion that we don't need to have anymore of like, is this thing a game? Is this thing a this? It's like, it doesn't matter. Like, is it, are you enjoying it? Does it move you, surprise you? Like, is, is this 10 hours of your life well spent? Um, you know, that to me is the kind of core question. Of course. So last question here, I mean, you, so with this 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 game, this interactive movie, uh, as we mentioned, you directed pretty much three different styles of, of, of film, three different period films. Uh, you did this while making 
designing a game. Would, so at this moment, if you decide to make a movie, and I don't know if you, you, and maybe you should, because it seems like it would be an easier endeavor now, where people talk about how <laughs> difficult making a movie is. So you're like, so you got that down easy now. Like it would be a much easier thing to do since you don't have to make it now with a video game. Do you want to make movies at some point? That is that is usually the joke, right? We'll get to the end of these things, and the crew will be like, "Hey, dude, I really enjoyed stretching myself, right? I t you know, using these muscles I wouldn't normally use, doing this weird, crazy experimental thing that you've come up with. But next time, let's just make a move. Like, that would be so easy. <laughs> and it's always funny, and it's always funny because making a move is incredibly hard, right? Like it's not it's not an easy thing. But coming out of these things, you're like, yeah, that really, that sounds relaxing. Like, yeah. like it's a movie and it's 90 minutes long and it starts here and it ends here. Like, wow, that does sound relaxing. Um, I have, I mean, when Her Story came out, I did have a bunch of offers um, from like movie people who played it and, and were kind of obsessed with it. And again, at the time, it, it always felt like a fun thing to do, right? Like, oh, wow, that actually sounds like, I, I mean, I love movies love telling stories, whatever the, the medium is. So it always felt like that would be a fun thing to do. But life is short, right? You only get to make so many things. And I'd always have like the next idea for the next game. And I'll be excited for trying something I hadn't seen before mm. and pushing something in a different direction. So it always felt like I could go make this thing or, or make this other thing. And the thing that feels a bit fresher and, and, and kind of challenging is the one that is more appealing to me right and and, yeah. and on a kind of very uh basic level uh, it is probably part of me that's like it's cool to be on the cutting edge of this stuff in this small pond right how many people are out there making these kind of crazy interactive movie things um versus jumping into what right now is like the hardest market for making movies and television yeah, ever. Yeah. There is just so much stuff, right? So I can be I can be one of the, you know, few people doing this stuff uh, and having fun like pushing ahead. Um, or I could jump into this thing, which sounds fun, but now I'm competing with thousands of other incredibly talented people, making their own things and, and kind of all competing to get attention. Um, you know, in that world. So yeah. yeah, I mean, if I if I had if I had a thousand years, I'd be like, yeah, I'm gonna have to take a break. <laughs> I'm gonna do something easy, like make a movie. And then maybe I'll do some, you know, I'll build a rocket ship, do some brain surgery, <laughs> all these easy things, and then I'll come back to the the interactive games. But um, yeah, so it's it's you know, and I grew up like playing, you know, pretty much the moment I started, you know, writing my own stories, and and I was really into painting early on. Once I started painting. At the same time, I was like drawing pictures on my computer or, you know, when I was writing stories, I was also creating little text adventures and strange little things on my computer. So I've always kind of been playing games alongside all the other media. I've always been thinking interactively. So for me, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't choosing between things. It was just natural for me that this kind of telling stories in an interactive place was, was just something that was kind of part of, of you know, it was what was around me when uh, I was growing up. So, well, I mean, from everything I've been reading, uh, you, you, if you ever just decide to make a movie, you're a natural at it, man. Everybody's talking about how good you are with with, with your actors. So, hey, you know, you could probably, hey, you might, look, you might wake up one day and you made a movie you don't even know because <laughs> it comes that, <laughs> comes that easy to you now. Uh, it's with the, the, it is with the cliche, right? Is ninety percent of directing is casting. Yeah, uh, and that right. is. And I'm lucky as well because I'm writing these things as well. Like it's, and we put so much planning because we have to, right? It's because of the complexity of the, the kind of gameplay and the game side of it. You have to plan these stories in a tons of detail. So when I show up on the set, people are, are surprised. <laughs> and, and not to judge other directors, but apparently a lot of movie directors just kind of show up, <laughs> sit in their trailer, <laughs> you know, go to, to Video Village, shout some direction sit back like they don't and i show up and i'm like here is all my preparation here is the backstory here is how all this works and actors will ask me a question i'll be like oh and, and then we'll talk for an hour and explain how it all works because <laughs> we've had to like we've had to kind of go through that process so yeah it's the cheat is we, we do we have some very good casting directors and uh and, and as well it's the other cheat is like when we're speaking to actors 
because these things are so complicated and challenging, you, you, you know, a lot of actors will self-select out, right? You'll go up to <laughs> them and be like, do you want to be in this interactive video game? And some of them will be like, no, nah, that's all right. I'm, I'm holding out for the big Netflix show. It's going to pay me, right? So you, you, you don't get those people. And then when you meet the, the people that are interested and you talk them through the process, when they hear how intense it's going to be and like, oh, we're going to be shooting these things in a single take and you're going to be playing a character that is not only a character, but is an actor playing a character and also has this other stuff going on and, and doing all these complicated things. There's a certain type of actor whose eyes light up, right? And, and get really excited about that. And, and so that's like you're already you're kind of winning because you're getting the actors who are the most ambitious, who have the kind of work ethic or like the just the craft to be able to jump into these things. So it's a cheat, right? Is is is, is all that complexity it means yeah. that you you, know, you show up on set, you already have this team of actors who are kind of really you know at the top of their game, um, and then it's just a case of uh, pulling in everyone else, right? Getting the ca best camera team you can, getting the amazing costume and art team and makeup and everything and then they make you look good and then people say you're a good director and you're like yeah uh it's all me you're very talented but you're also very modest you know <laughs> it's, it's, it's a nice quality but it's incredible what you've done here with the game you know it's uh in the ambition that you have behind these man it looks like it's really paid off for you so congratulations on that uh it's been great to talk to you I've enjoyed sitting back listening to you and hearing about the whole process and uh, and your creative process. And, you know, being that we've talked about this and everybody's heard about the work that's gone into it, how unique this game is, uh, go check it out, folks. Uh, it's Immortality, the game that we were talking about today. Uh, we were talking about where you can find this. This is found on the Xbox, uh, Game Pass, Steam, also on PC. Am I missing anything here? Uh, yeah, you get it. if you're playing on PC, there's uh, GOG.com. It's another website you can get it from. And like I say, very soon, very soon, like I'm going to get off this and go speak to my programmers uh, very soon on, on Netflix for phones. So everyone that has phones will be able to play it. So, um, yeah, get out there and play it and tell me what you think of it. Yeah. Like, it's, it's in the reactions. It's been really fun. Yeah. Yeah. One of the it's, best uh, reviewed this, games this of 2022. Stuff that makes people, yeah. Yeah, you know, you've got your Elden Rings, you've got your God of Wars, <laughs> these big things. But, you know, if you want something very sophisticated, you know, a very special flavor of game that is highly reviewed, then Immortality is the one. All the cool kids are playing Immortality right now. So that's the thing. Yeah. yeah. If you want to go to a cool kid's party and you turn up and everyone's talking about immortality, and you don't know what they're talking about, you're going to look, you know, you feel pretty dumb. Yeah, you don't want to be stupid, you do need you? You take. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Go get immortality. <laughs> hey, uh, th thank you so much uh, for, for doing this, man. Again, uh, it's been a privilege, and congratulations on everything. And, uh, I've, and it's just been a real pleasure. I mean, listening to you has actually been creatively inspiring to me. I want to go off and do something at, right after I'm done. I want to be, I want to be productive. So... Okay. Everybody, this is Sam Barlow, creator and designer of Immortality. Uh, check out the game, and uh, thank you, man. I really appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Thanks, man. It's been fun talking. Thanks for taking the time. All right. See ya. And I'll, I'll cut that off for you. <laughs> the, I'll end the meeting. And Beautiful. Thanks, man. There he goes. And hey, girl, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I had to throw you down. That really was inspiring, man. I'm going to cut this interview off, which I already did, but I'm going to cut this stream off. I'm going to start recording, and I'm going to go and do something with my life after this. I'm going to pull out my iPad. I'm going to start drawing. I'm going to start doing a bunch of stuff today. Uh, in addition to doing all of the creative stuff that you out there influenced me to do, such as coming in and doing these interviews. I couldn't do this without you. It's been, again, something that has has been really cool for me to be able to, that's something that you've done for me, to be able to go and talk to all these creative people, talk to people who've been my, my heroes, talk to people that I've seen their work all my life and most of my life and been in, being able to go in and talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, you have made that possible for me. So I really appreciate that. And that is why I wanna let you know, we have, I, you know, I always forget to do this. I always forget to bring this up and I should do that more. You know, we do have a lot of these, these interviews that we have done. 
And I've been doing them a lot of times just for fun and to kind of keep my interview skills kind of sharp. But I need to promote these more. I need to get this out to you a little bit more. Because we've done a ton of these interviews with so many interesting people. Let me see. There it is. Double Toasted Interviews. That's our Double Toasted Interviews channel right here. Double Toasted Interviews, go check that out. Uh, again, something I don't really push or promote is mostly done for kind of my pleasure, but I'm going to start figuring out what to do with these. I'm going to start putting these maybe on a podcasting platform. They stand out. You know, I have my own YouTube channel, and when I, when I, well, I have a YouTube channel that is under my name, Corey Coleman. I don't ever use it. It was just something I set up years ago for for a, a, a business thing that was happening. I just used it briefly. But I might start putting some of the more personal things that I have up there, and maybe some of these interviews will be a part of that too. But go check it out, Double Toasted Interviews. I've done interviews with so many different people out there, with so many different creatives, ranging from actors to directors to writers, video game developers, animators, uh, YouTubers, podcasters, all kind of stuff, man. Again, I've been very fortunate, and you have made that part of my life very much possible. So with that said, folks, like I told you, that man made me feel creative. I'm going to go do some stuff. But before I go, since you are so kind to me, I leave my doors open to you 24-7. I might not be able to answer that door all the time because I might be asleep. But you can always, you can always send me an email and I'll try to get a hold of you as soon as I wake up or whenever I get to it. And for those of you who've been with me for a while, you know that email. K Coolmans. Well, it'd be nice if I had some sound on this. Let's try that again. K Coolmans at gmail.com. That is K C O O L M A N Z at gmail.com. You email us with any kind of questions, comments, compliments, insults, input, and our advice. Hit us up on our social medias Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. TikTok, you don't see it there, but we have one. Patreon, you don't see it there, but we have one. Just go to those platforms and type in Double Toasted. Or you see that information that we have right here. Copy all that down, memorize it, love it, use it. Or just go to the platforms and type in Double Toasted, and it will take you where you need to go. Also, if you're in Austin, Texas, please come see us. Again, email us, kcoolmans at gmail.com, and let us know what your plans are for Austin. Are you moving here? Are you just passing through? Whatever you're doing, don't hesitate to let us know, but just let us know early so that we can clear our schedules and hang out with you. And folks, once again, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for making all this possible. I very much appreciate it. Gonna get on out of here now. Enjoy the rest of my weekend. I hope you also too, whenever you, well, whenever you're listening to this. Good night, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Whenever you are listening to or watching this, Goodbye and stay toasted.